Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to Grace Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Sharon Jackson. I am one of the elders here and I would like to meet you after the service. And if you're visiting with us online, we're glad that you're here as well. And uh, we pray that uh, today would be, well, we know that today is God's day because isn't that right? Every day is his day. So uh, let us join in the call to worship. It's from Psalm 22, verse 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving. You are God, and there is none like you. You are our shepherd. You lead us. You guide us. Everything that we do, you know about. Lord, you direct us in all our lives, in everything that we do. As we come here today to worship you, may our praise, may our songs be as sweet incense to you. May we remember who you are. May we remember of what you have done for us. May we remember the love that you have given to us. And Lord, we pray that our worship would be pleasing to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, join me now, would you please, in singing hymn number four, Come Thou Almighty King.
Amen. Please be seated. So for the season of Lent, we're going to be doing these congregational responsive readings for our prayer of confession. And this is just an opportunity for us to come together to confess these things together. And then also to spend a moment in silence afterwards to just uh, consider what it is that, uh, that God is laying on our hearts that we need to uh, put down before him. And so I'm going to read the part of leader, and I invite you to come in uh, to pray and to uh, then to uh, read the all. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Lord, have mercy. Amen. So now let's spend a moment in silence before the Lord. Lord, thank you that you hear us in this short moment Thank you that your Holy Spirit moves in our lives to bring up those things that we do need to come before you with, that we do need to confess before you. Thank you for this good news, that this is the truth in Jesus Christ, that Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and that he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, at this time, I just want to call the kids to come forward. Some of are feeling kind of shy. Where's my own son? <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, as the kids are heading up, I'm just going to uh, go through some of these announcements for us. Uh, I want to uh, quickly say thank you for those who took part in the coldest night of the year walk yesterday. 
And so that was an event that was held for Fernie House, uh, which is just the, uh, the uh, ministry, uh, the program that's just at the end of our driveway here, they rent from us. Um, and so the, uh, the group, we did reach our Gold Church, so really, really great, congratulations. It's, uh, I'm really, really heartened by it. But we reached the goal of $1,000 and we actually went over. And so we met it and surpassed that goal. So I'm really, really glad and thankful for you all, those of you who were able to uh, participate and those who were able to participate by donating as well. Um, also, just uh, as the kids were heading out, you might have noticed that some of the bigger kids headed out as well. And so please keep the juniors in prayer. Uh, we're doing a profession of faith class. And so um, any of the kids that are around grade six to grade eight, uh, they've been, some have been baptized when they were infants. And some of them are also exploring their faith for, uh, for baptism purposes. And so this is a great class for the kids to really explore their faith, to ask good questions, and, uh, and so they need our prayer, that uh, in these good questions and in this ex exploration, that the Lord would make it abundantly clear to them how much he loves them and what he has done for them. And so please do pray for them as you remember. Um, and uh, they're upstairs in the, uh, they're in class right now with Kavina. Also wanted to bring to your attention again, just to save the date for the St. Patrick's Day, March 23rd get together. So that's a week after St. Patrick's Day. And that's uh, because, you know, with March break during that week, we didn't want to uh, miss anybody. And so please save that date. That's Saturday, March 23rd, uh, 6.30 p.m. Come and bring all your, um, your potluck and things like that. Uh, but then at 7 p.m. is when we're actually going to get started. And so the instructions have been wear green and also that there will be um, some dance preparation and things like that. I am neither Irish nor a dancer, but I'm going to be participating. It's going to be a fantastic time. And so if you are able, uh, please join in. Uh, last, uh, last two, uh, photo directory. Those who haven't done so yet, please complete a contact form. And so we're, uh, we want to get a directory back up and running. So as you leave the sanctuary, a contact form will be provided and can be completed at the table set up in the narthex. There are pens there as well. And then when you are done signing those out, filling those out, uh, you can put those into the green buckets that are provided there as well. These forms can be completed individually or as a couple or as a family. And so you can put your kids on there as well. Uh, on Sunday, March 3rd, during the AGM, so that's this coming, uh, next coming Sunday, uh, at the, during the AGM, and the weeks following, photos will be taken, and there will be additional forms available for people who are absent as well. And so we're going to get our directory nice and populated, uh, and that'll be a really good opportunity to just uh, revamp and renew our photo directory. Lastly is that the annual general uh, meeting, the report is now available. So that's, uh, that's the report for 2023. For those who haven't participated in an annual general meeting before, it sounds kind of intimidating. So next Sunday, we're going to be having a joint service at 10 a.m. And then afterwards, we continue on in worship in the work that we do together. Right? And so it really is an act of worship when we are uh, looking at the budgets, when we are celebrating the year that was, and we hear the things that God has done with the, the money that you know, the, the good people of grace have donated. Uh, and it goes into our ministry, and so we get to celebrate that, that good things were accomplished in 2023. But then we also look, get to look at this budget for upcoming 2024, and we get to look at what the plans are in ministry for the 2024 year, and look at the budget there as well, and discuss that also. And so I do want to uh, ensure, uh, make sure that you knew about that, um, and to invite you to that as well. And those reports that have those figures and have those stories and have those good things for us, they'll be available afterwards, after the service today. There are 50 that are printed, so if you're not able to get one and you're like, I really do want one, um, I sent a soft copy out. And so if you wanted a soft copy, I could email that out to you if you, don't, uh, if you haven't received it. But if you wanted that, uh, uh, that hard copy you can, uh, and you don't get one today, you can ask me for it and then I'll make sure to print out uh, those for also for the meeting as well. All right, uh, so those are the announcements for this week. Right now, we're going to be giving back to the Lord a portion of all that he has given to us, if you are able to at this time in this season, as the Spirit leads you to, to give to the ministry of our church, and so I want to invite the ushers to come forward at this time.
Let's pray together. It says in your word, Lord, that you love joyful givers. And so, God, may you continue to transform us, that we would hold things with an open hand, and that we would be generous. We want to entrust our whole lives to you in every possible way. But you, Lord, know what work needs to be done in our hearts. And so we ask that you would use these generous gifts from your people, that you would use it to grow your kingdom here. Help us to faithfully serve this neighborhood. Help us uh, to have wisdom in our use of these good gifts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading is taken from Exodus 33, verses 1 to 17. Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord has said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring on the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped. Each of the each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Here endeth the word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you speak to us and that you meet with us. But Lord, you know that uh, there's lots of things that can distract us, lots of things that can take away from hearing you. But Lord, I want to pray that uh, you would help us to hear your voice this morning. That anything that may have happened this past week or even this morning, that you would speak and clear through it all and meet us here. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, uh, may they be pleasing and acceptable to you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we saw how the people of Israel broke the covenant with the Lord almost instantaneously. They received the covenant. They said all the right things. They were excited. They said, yes, we will worship God. We will follow his ways. And then they failed. While Moses was on the mountaintop, he was receiving special instructions from the Lord in how to worship him and the Lord also gave him the Ten Commandments formed and written by the Lord himself. And I'm talking about like the, the power and hand of God took the rock and turned it into these tablets, formed it into tablets. And then with that same hand, he wrote on it the Ten Commandments. Now, while he was up there on that mountaintop receiving this word, the people grew impatient and they turned to idol worship. Make no mistake, friends, they had already received the Ten Commandments verbally. Moses had gone through it carefully with them, and that's what they turned to and said, yes, we will follow this. But instantaneously, in their impatience, they turned to idol worship, and they bowed down to a God of their own making, and in doing so, they broke the first two commandments 
right away. Aaron tried to make it better. The leaders who had told Aaron, build this idol for us, you know, they said, here are your gods, O Israel, and they pointed this golden calf. And when Aaron saw this, and he heard that they wanted to do this festival, they wanted to hold this worship to it, he tried to make it better by identifying this idol with the Lord, saying, okay, so this isn't just any god, this is the Lord, but he's still pointing at this golden calf and saying, tomorrow we will bow down and worship the Lord, this golden calf. This is the Lord who's led you out of Egypt. This was no better. It was no better. 3,000 Israelites were struck down that day by the Levites who were for the Lord, who were for his holiness, and not only that, but a plague broke out against the Israelites. Paul notes in 2 Corinthians that that day, 23,000 people died. So it's not here in the text, but it's revealed to Paul, perhaps in uh, Jewish culture at that time, that it's the understanding was that 23,000 fell. A plague broke out against the Israelites. Moses tried to stand in the gap as their mediator, which was the rule that he was called to do, if you remember. He would bring the people's concerns to the Lord, and he would speak the Lord's word to the people. And at this moment, he said, Lord, please don't blot out the people in your anger. Instead, blot out my name from the book of life. But this was not enough to pay for this egregious sin. And in chapter 32, verse 34, just the previous chapter to this, there is a first look at what else the Lord was thinking, that he would not lead the people personally any longer. He said, my angel will go before you, but it's not him, it's not the Lord. He says, it's just the one that I will send in front of you. And so that is what we're seeing in a continuation of in today's text. In today's text, we see this continuation of this mediation that, that, the, that uh, Moses is bringing before God. Because the Lord was continuing to distance himself from the people of Israel. Their sin was too great. The chasm was too great for them to bridge. And now he was saying, I can't go before you. I cannot be with you. But Moses mediated on his people's behalf. He petitioned the Lord to continue to be with them, to continue to lead them. Because continuing in God's presence requires God's man to mediate. For the people to continue on in God's presence, it required God's man to mediate. And we're going to see that that's still the same for us today. It's still the same. We're going to see this in three movements where we first see that a holy God cannot make space for, cannot overlook our sin. But the second movement is God's blessing is in his presence And that is where we will see that to continue in that presence requires this mediation. It requires someone to step in the gap for us. And so this first movement, a holy God cannot make space for or overlook our sin. The idea that God is love and he can just overlook our wrongdoing because he is love, this is a false idea. It's a partial truth that leads to the wrong conclusion because God is love. He has said so of himself. But he is also holy and perfect. And it is out of his holiness that he loves so fully. And you can't just carve out the part that you don't want, that you don't like. Just as you might get upset because someone you love chooses the wrong path leading to a painful and ruinous time and you can see it but for whatever reason they can't they're blinded think of the god of all creation seeing his beloved go wayward moving away from their intended good and beautiful purposes the opposite of love isn't anger but the opposite of love is hate which leads to indifference and not caring at all And the fact that God cares so deeply with such heat is a sign of his love. The sin of his people in making the golden calf and worshiping it broke the covenant that he had set with them. He said, this is the way to follow me. And in this way of following me, this is the way that your life will flourish. These Ten Commandments aren't meant as a heavy weight around your neck to drag you down, to kill you. But instead, it's to give you deeper life, more meaningful life. They had previously stated, as I said before, they had said, we will follow, we'll do it. 
Moses took the book of the covenant. He read it to the people, and they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood. This is when they offered their sacrifices, their burnt offerings and their fellowship offerings. And Moses took that blood, and he sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And we talked about how the blood covers over them but it's, it's impermanent, it's not as good, and it's foreshadowing Jesus. But they said, in their excitement, after hearing the word, after knowing that this is God's covenant with them, we will obey, we'll do it. Does this feel familiar? It sure feels familiar to me. I've said this, feeling the conviction, yeah, Lord, I'm going to do that. But do we? After affirming the covenant, they offered these burnt offerings. Well, they offered these burnt offerings first. And remember that the burnt offerings are for their sins. To say that this animal that has been burned holy, burned fully, that is what I deserve, but this animal is getting it on my behalf. And they gave thanks for their right relationship with God with their fellowship offerings. This is what these people did, and this is what we see in chapter 32, verse 6, in the previous chapter is the people offered these same offerings to the golden calf. In 32 verse 6, it says this, The next day the people rose early and they sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Exactly the same wording. And afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and then they got up to indulge in revelry. The people offered these same offerings to this false god. They had taken God's gracious avenue to have their sins forgiven, to have this chance to be in right relationship with him, and then they twisted it and they broke it, and they were making it something completely different by doing it on their own terms. So they were saying, we did this for God, and now we're going to do it for this God that we're calling God but isn't. We're making our own way. We're doing our own thing. We're making our path forward. And this is why legalism is so egregious to God. Because it's taking man's way of making our own way to God. Do you see it? It's belief in Jesus and adding on top of that the X, Y, Z laws to make ourselves right and to prove ourselves right. And so when we are legalistic before God and we say, okay, we are following Jesus, but we're also going to do this, this, and this. And then we're proving ourselves right before him. It smacks of religious pride that can sneak in if we're not careful to remember God's grace and to humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord. That is only by God's grace alone that we are saved. But in response, we're living out the commandments. We're living out these ways. We're living ways that we want to please him, not the way, not the flip side where we're trying to do these things so that we can earn his favor. Do you you see the subtle difference? And we might be choosing the way of righteousness and choosing the path of trying to, you know, grow closer to the Lord. And those are good things. You know, as I was saying to the kids, and I was trying to be careful, you know, reading the Bible every day is so important for us, but if we start to feel really good about it, and we start to look down on others, I'm reading my Bible, and I'm reading more than you are, right? it starts to creep in that I am doing something to prove myself to God, and that can't be the way. That is adding our own thing on top of Jesus. On the other hand, this is why lawlessness is also so egregious to God, because they were doing their own things according to their own made-up ways, and it's apart from the covenant law. It's their own made-up stuff. You know, Paul warned that we live in a time where we want our ears tickled. We don't want to prove ourselves to God, but we want to live the life of flourishing that he has for us by living according to his ways. But Paul warned we live in a time where this is happening, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Now, we're in such danger of doing that, all of us. I don't like the way that sounds. I want it to be this way instead. I like Jesus, but I don't like Paul, so I'm just going to carve out that part of the Bible and not follow that. We are doing this. We are 
having these burnt sacrifices, these fellowship offerings in our own way when we do it this way. And so God says, I cannot be in your presence. And it's out of his mercy that he would not lead them. It's out of his mercy and his justice that he can't be in their presence, that he would not lead them. Because if he was in their midst, their sin deserved his wrath, just as he had initially stated. He said, I have seen these people. They are stiff-necked. Now leave me alone in my anger so that my anger may burn against them, that I might destroy them, that I'll make you into a great nation. It's out of his mercy that he says, I cannot be with these people or they will be wiped out. It's out of his mercy, but it's also out of his justice that he says, I cannot be with these people or they will be wiped out. He had to get away. Instead, of, instead Moses knew this, and this is what we see in the second movement, is that God's blessing is in his presence. The instructions on how to worship the Lord were finished being given to Moses. That's what we see. 30, 31 verse 18, we see that, that uh, all the things had been given, all the ways of worship, the ways that the tabernacle was supposed to be constructed just so, that all the tools for the tabernacle were, de- were to be constructed for use in wo- of worship, were to be done just so. And as he's finishing up, that's when the Lord says, hey, something's going on down at the camp. This time of worship, this time of setting up worship was interrupted in a sense by the people's failure. You know, this chapter 33 is interesting because it harkens back to the very beginning when the Lord called out to Moses the first time. How do I know that? In chapter 33, we read that the people are at Mount Horeb. So it's a, another name for Mount Sinai. It's, it's, a, it's the same mountain, the mountain of God. And in chapter 33, instead of using the name Mount Sinai, he uses the word Mount Horeb, which takes us all the way back to Exodus chapter 3 when Moses is at Mount Horeb. And God speaks to him there. And God says to him, I will lead my people. I will use you to lead my people out of the land. And God had promised to Moses in chapter 3, I will go with you. I will be with you. And here in chapter 33, it's, a, it's just, he's heartbroken. He says, I can't, I can't do it. But instead, he offered to go only with Moses. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And that's in verse 14 of chapter 33. And what he's saying there is, it's singular, I will go, but I will go only with you, Moses, because you're the only one out of this whole entire people that I want to go with at this point. I will go with you. I will give you rest. But Moses understood the importance of God's presence, that he needed to be with all of them, with all of them to lead and guide the nation and to lead them to ultimate rest, to ultimate victory, but it could only be in his presence. This is the same promise that Jesus made to us, and this is why it's so important to us that he never leaves us, because this is what he said. I am with you always, lo, to the very end of the age. This is why it's so comforting, because Jesus said that he will always stick with us, that he will always be with us. This is why it is so important to understand the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as well. What the Lord has done for us in Jesus is that he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're not left alone to live and to try to follow him according to our own strength, which isn't strength at all. We can't do it. We don't have it in us. We have the Holy Spirit who indwells us always, and we read about that in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 11. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we have the presence of God in us always. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. But if Christ is in you, 
because of his spirit who lives in you. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we say that, you know, we've said that prayer, those of us who follow Jesus, Lord, be the Lord over my life. I invite you into my heart. We've said something like that, perhaps. And what we're really saying is it's Jesus living in my heart, but it's also the spirit of Christ who lives within us always, daily. We are indwelt by the spirit always. The blessing is in God's presence We also read that we are sealed by the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 1. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. We are indwelt by the Spirit of God, the very Spirit of God who empowers us. We are sealed by the promised Holy Spirit, which means that we are marked and we are called his. The blessing is in his presence. But we can't be there because of, because of sin. The chasm is too great. And so we see Moses stepping into this role as mediator in their third movement to continue in God's presence. It requires God's man. It requires him to step into the gap. It is through God's grace and mercy that the Lord even continued to meet with Moses. Moses would set up that tent of meeting outside of the camp. It's not the tabernacle, but he would set it up outside of the encampment so that he could meet with God, and God in his grace and in his mercy says, I will meet with you there, even though that is a facsimile, even though that is a a pale comparison to what I wanted to do with you, but I will meet with you there, and I will speak with you there. And in there, that is where Moses stood on behalf of the people saying, God, you got to go with us. You have to go with us. And his argument was this, is that your glory will be revealed in your people. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth is the question he asks to God in verse 16. If you, God, don't go with us, there will be no distinguishing us from all the other people of the earth. He's saying that, you know, one God will be like any God, and if we even, if we testify and say, hey, our God led us out of Egypt, where is he? We'll be just like everyone else. And so he says to him in this conversation, it says that as a friend, he met with God, and he's saying to God, you got to go with us. This is to distinguish yourself. This is for your glory that you need to go with us. And Moses is having this conversation where he's mediating, he's praying, he's interceding on their behalf. We see this, that Moses is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. You know, in this chasm, he's holding out his arms, Moses, and he's saying, if I can just reach over here and I can be a human bridge so that my people can go from that chasm where they've broken relationship and they can just walk and meet back up with God over here, but his arms are too small. He can't reach both sides, but it foreshadows Christ who has done the same for us, who stands in the gap and who is able on the cross. This is what we're remembering this season of Lent that our sins have stained us. Just like the Israelites, it makes us worthy of death alone. That's all we're good for. That's what we're really, that's what we really deserve of God's wrath born from his righteous holiness. And know the good that you have done in your life is not enough to tip the scales of goodness in your favor. And we cannot paint a picture of God of, oh well, good enough, before an almighty and holy God who says, I need perfection. You can't come before me like that. But he loves us so much that his mercy and compassion are turned towards us in Christ. Do you see that? Do you feel that? Are you warmed to your core with gratitude and a sense of humbling ourselves before the Lord because of what lengths God took in order that we could be with him. We don't identify with Moses in this text. Oftentimes, you know, this is a a good Bible study practice. When you're reading a narrative, place yourself 
in each of the characters that you see there, obviously not in the role of God, but when you are reading scripture and it's a narrative, it's a story format, you can place yourself as the hero. You can place yourself as the people. And I would say that that's where we need to place ourselves in this text. We don't identify with Moses, but instead we are the rebellious ones. That's who we identify with. Looking at this more fully, look what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 34. This is what we'll see what it is that God has done on our behalf, what is illustrated in this passage. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. We need an intercessor. We need someone standing in the gap. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will we not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one, Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. It's a long passage. The Holy Spirit of God intercedes for us, mediates for us, stands in the gap for us, taking up our prayers up to God the Father, but not only that, Jesus Christ, God the Son, is also interceding on our behalf so that no charge sticks to us, no condemnation stains us, and it was God the Father who graciously gave us his only Son. And our Creator, Father, and Judge satisfied his own sentence and provides us the only way for life to its fullest, life to its freest, a life where because of what he has done, he does not leave us but is with us. To continue in God's presence requires God's man to mediate, and God provides this man, the ultimate man in Jesus Christ. He does not leave us, but is always with us, and he's the one who supplies it for himself. He's the one who pays the cost with his own life. Out of his grace and out of his mercy to us. Do you you see what I'm trying to say here? I'm building the case here that in every step we have such a huge debt that we cannot pay. That there's such a huge chasm that has been created that we cannot cross. And that is only through Jesus Christ whom God provided himself. God the Son stands in the gap. He takes it all and he intercedes and he is our mediator on our behalf. This Lent, we come before our God knowing that we need him in every respect, in every aspect of our lives. We need him. So let's be loved by him and love him back in return with our obedience, with humility. And it's not a really great word that we like hearing, but with submission. We do these things because we realize the great cost that he has paid We do this because he is the only one who could do it, and he has done it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for your continued presence in our lives because we need you. Every moment of every day, we need you. And so, God, thank you for standing in the gap for us, for providing the way for us, that even though we are lost in sin, Lord, you are the one who reaches out to us. God, you know this world we live in, 
and how much pain it is in as well. And so we continue to pray for peace in these war-torn areas. We pray for your spirit of peace to descend, to change hearts and minds, to uh, embolden and strengthen our brothers and sisters in Christ in those areas, that you would strengthen them for ministry. We want to pray for their peace, for their comfort. And we pray for our church, that, Lord, we are the rebellious ones, but we give you thanks that we have been saved by grace alone. And keep us close, Lord, to following the authority of Scripture, what you've written for us. Renew us, revive us, we pray, transform us. Not only us, Lord, but also for our whole denomination as well. God, keep us close to you and wake us up. Lord, we bring before you our Grace family, those of our loved ones that we just want to bring before you now for prayer. We pray for Trinity for healing, also for Sinead. We pray for the Weathers family, for Rick and Jenny and Elizabeth. We pray for Ellie. We pray for Marilyn Stodinger after this terrible accident on the wheel trans. God, we pray for her healing of her body. But thank you that uh, um, thank you that she's uh, recuperating. But God, we just want to pray for a whole healing. We want to pray for Thanu as well as she recovers from her surgery. Lord, there are others in our minds as well, but we bring them before you in our hearts. We know that you hear us. We know that you intercede for us. And let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. It's on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We now gather at Christ's table by his invitation. This is the table of the Lord. Jesus said this, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never be hungry, and those who believe in me will never be thirsty. No one who comes to me will I drive away. He invites us and receives us. So whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we do everything for the glory of God. And so I want to invite the, uh, the elders to come forward at this time. So when you are ready and as you are ready, please come down to receive the elements from the elders at the front, uh, coming through the middle aisle. Uh, there is also a gluten-free option that is the same option for those of you who may feel more comfortable getting a prepackaged communion kit. After receiving the fruit of the vine and the bread, take it back to your seat through the side aisles uh, and then wait so that we can eat together. So come through the middle and then cycle back to your seats through the sides. And so let's come together now.
Take this blessing with you now as we are sent out from this place. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.